Hola, ¿me escuchan? Sí. Buenos dias. I'm so pleased to welcome all of you today. My name is Ana Maria Gilagos, and I'm president and CEO of Hispanics in Philanthropy. It'll be my great honor to serve as your MC during the next two days. I know we are meeting at a very difficult time for our country, indeed for the world. Before last week, the nation's attention was transfixed on the horrors that COVID-19 was inflicting on our people and on our economy. What a difference a week makes. In the last few days, we have seen unwarranted and senseless killing. George Floyd, a man buying food for his family. Ahmaud Arbery, jogging in his own neighborhood. And Breonna Taylor, an EMT, killed while sleeping in her home. This has rightfully led to outrage in cities across the United States and indeed around the world. It has forced us to reflect on who we are as a people and what is the world that we are trying to build. For me, it's personal. It was exactly 40 years ago in Miami, in the city that I called home, that I witnessed the Liberty City riots as a child. I was watching the Miami skyline burning from the roof of the hotel where I worked as a cashier at the pharmacy, and I witnessed the raw edges of our city's racial tensions split open. For me, it was a defining moment. Many, many people lost their homes and their livelihoods in those tense days in Miami. People were frustrated with a system that discriminated against them in every single way. They simply had had enough. Witnessing the city's destruction and the frustration inspired me to dedicate my life to address these injustices so that neither Miami nor any other city would ever burn again. However, very sadly, 40 years later, on the first day of our HIP summit, Cities across the country continue to burn and it's a drumbeat of anguish. The wounds of social injustice are still very much fresh in our country's collective mind. In the last few days though, we've witnessed a new generation rising up in collective anger, despair, and in pain. But there's an underlying emotion and that is love. That is unity. And that's a great desire for systems change like never before. This is all happening against a backdrop of a global pandemic that in the U.S. alone has cost more than 100,000 lives. And the most affected by this pandemic are low-income communities of color, given that our communities are most likely to lack access to health care that they need. They've been left behind by an economy which makes the economy possible. So HIP joins in saying, we are fed up. We are fed up with a system that reeks of embedded structural and historical racism that perpetuates institutional bias. And I say basta ya. The moment has never been more urgent, the need greater to work against racism and towards social justice. Because to do nothing, to remain neutral is no longer an option. Silence and inaction are signs of complicity. The status quo will no longer be tolerated. We know that we are meeting in this very challenging climate and it's very difficult. But we know it's more important to convene because there are hunger for connectivity within our community. And at HIP, we wanted to hold a collective space, a space for all of us to grieve, to heal, to grow, to celebrate, and to be in each other's company. HIP wanted to create a space to shut but also to imagine and to feed our need to act. And I'm really pleased to say that that need was evident because today we have 700 attendees which are registered for this summit. I help, hope that you will get to meet many of others during the next two days because we're here to use our voice and to reimagine what the future looks like for our community, to harness the collective power of our philanthropy. So thank you again for joining us today we look forward to your participation, your ideas, your contributions. 
Our communities need us more now than ever. Welcome to the Hip Familia. And it's my great pleasure now to introduce you to Flori Perez, a Mayan leader. She's a healer working with people in Guatemala and in Southern Mexico. So there, Flori will guide us through a ceremony to interweave our hearts with the intention of healing our community and honoring the many, many that have passed away these past few months due to the twin pandemics of COVID-19 and racism. Thank you. Buenos días a todos, a todas. Buenos días en este, pues en este día tan especial para, para HIP, para todas las organizaciones que, pues que están unidas en este, en este momento, en este espacio. Eh, agradeciendo siempre por, pues por la vida, por los procesos que aún que sean de esta, de esta manera. Eh, de esta manera virtual que este tiempo nos, pues también nos, nos muestra, nos enseña. Eh, yo creo que esto es importante, seguir con estos vínculos, seguir con estas formas de, de comunicación, de siempre no, no callarnos frente a todas las, las situaciones, sino justo buscar formas de, de estar juntos, de estar juntas para seguir fortaleciéndonos, para seguir o creando juntos, juntas, y para seguir pues caminando en estos procesos que, que HIP y todas las organizaciones que, pues, que son apoyadas por, por HIP también, eh, pues entre todas, digamos, entrelazan las fuerzas y, y agradezco mucho entonces este, esta oportunidad de estar aquí y quisiera en este momento pues acompañarles, estar con ustedes desde esta forma, desde esta forma que, que, pues que nos han enseñado nuestras abuelas, nuestros padres, nuestras madres, de, de iniciar siempre agradeciendo, de iniciar siempre intencionando, sabiendo hacia dónde queremos ir, direccionando siempre a dónde queremos ir, porque de lo contrario nos perdemos, de lo contrario eh, perdemos tiempo también. Entonces, eh, quiero pedirles a todos, a todas, si tienen sus veladoras, sus candelas, eh, ahí con ustedes, que puedan tenerlo ahí enfrente de ustedes, ahí a la mano, para que podamos eh, juntos, juntas, sentir esta, esta sintonía de nuestros corazones, esta sintonía de la palabra, esta sintonía de la construcción para que podamos encenderlo juntos, para que podamos eh, pues vibrar el corazón todos juntos, para caminar entonces todos juntos y como dice nuestro sagrado libro, el Popol Vuh, que nos enseña que nadie se queda atrás, que todos vayamos acompañándonos, tal vez unos más adelante, tal vez unos más atrás, sí, pero acompañándonos, no dejamos a nadie atrás, nos acompañamos todos juntos, entonces que podamos en este encendido de la, de la vela, de la veladora, candela que tengan ahí, podamos hacer esa, esa intención. Quisiera entonces, pues agradecer a este día, al Nahual Ajú, al Nahual Ajú, eh, Siete Ajú, que nos acompaña, el Nahual Ajú es el Nahual del la energía de nuestro Padre Sol, de nuestro Abuelo Sol, la energía de, de la luz, de la claridad, de lo, que nos, de lo que nos permite estar en claridad y no en oscuridad. Entonces, en este día tan importante que se, que se retoma en estas, esta conferencia de ustedes, pues quisiera pedir eso a todas las abuelas, a todos los abuelos, que cada uno de ustedes también pueda invocar, pueda hablar con sus linajes, con sus ancestros, con sus abuelas, para pedir siempre mucha sabiduría, para saber caminar juntos, porque caminar juntos también no, no siempre es fácil, pero es de mucho aprendizaje, es de, mucho, de muchas claridades también, como el Nahuala nos enseña. Entonces, así... Queremos también en este día, ante este corazón, ante estos corazones de todos ustedes, las organizaciones en las distintas partes de este planeta, quisiéramos también eh, pedir 
así conectarnos también con este tiempo que estamos viviendo, con esta energía del tiempo que estamos viviendo ante esta pandemia, ante esta situación que nos ha movido mucho, que tal vez algunos de ustedes eh, tal vez han tenido familiares enfermos o conocidos enfermos o conocidos fallecidos, pues poniendo así la mano en nuestro corazón, que aunque no hayamos conocido a las personas, que aunque no sean nuestros familiares, pero sí es un hermano, una hermana en esta humanidad, en esta especie humana que somos. Entonces, colocando nuestra mano en nuestro corazón también, hacemos el llamamiento a, a los espíritus de los que se han ido, ofrendando esta candela, ofrendando esta luz, ofrendando este corazón, esta intención, para que no se sientan solos ahora que se han ido, para que todos los que se han fallecido en España, en Italia, en México, en Estados Unidos, que han habido muchos, muchos fallecidos en Estados Unidos, en Guatemala, en todas las partes del mundo, en China, pidiendo mucho desde el corazón de cada uno de nosotros que estamos en este momento intencionándolo, diciéndoles que estamos ahí, que estamos aquí, que estamos con ellos, que estamos con ellas encendiendo esta candela, esta luz, para que se sientan acompañados, para que su espíritu no esté vagando, para que no, no esté en la soledad ni en la oscuridad. Ante este día, la Gualajú, pedimos mucho para que haya sol, para que la gente, para todas las personas que han fallecido, Tengan su sol, tengan su claridad, tengan su luz, tengan su, su vela, tengan su fuego, tengan su calor. Y para las personas que se han quedado, todos los familiares que se han quedado en, esta, en este dolor, en no poder acompañar a su familiar en, este, en esta transición del espíritu, pedimos mucha, mucha paz, pedimos mucha aceptación, sabemos que no es fácil. Sabemos que, que nos ha tomado por sorpresa, sabemos que no lo esperábamos, pero pedimos mucho, pedimos mucho para que cada corazón pueda aceptar y sobre todo reconocer que la materia siempre se transforma, pero el espíritu siempre está ahí, siempre puede llegar a través de los sueños, siempre puede llegar a través del viento, a través del fuego, a través del agua, a través de la tierra. Así, abuelos, abuelas, pidiendo mucho también por todo lo que se está viviendo, no solo en Estados Unidos, por todo el racismo que se vive, por toda la violencia que se vive, por todo el dolor que se vive. Abuelos, abuelas, pedimos perdón por la muerte de George Floyd, pero él ha sido la gota que ha derramado el vaso, porque... Han habido muchos antes que él, muchas mujeres antes que él, muchos pueblos antes que, que ellos. Y pedimos perdón por todo ese racismo que habita muchas veces en nuestros corazones y que queremos a veces cambiar hacia afuera, pero es adentro en donde pedimos también que se cambie todas esas formas de racismo que tenemos. Pedimos mucho, abuelos, abuelas, para que en esta digna rabia de toda la humanidad. Pedimos mucho para que también venga mucha paz, para que también venga mucho respeto por las culturas, por la diversidad, por lo diferente. Abuelos, ajahuajú, nahualajú, pedimos con todo el corazón, con toda la fuerza de nuestro amor, con toda la fuerza de nuestra vida y nuestros linajes, que son sagrados, que nos han enseñado siempre la construcción por la vida, por la paz, por la memoria, por la justicia. Pedimos, Creador y Formador, Madre Tierra, abuelos, abuelas, espíritus de los abuelos, a través de este encendido, de estas veladoras, de esta candela, de lo que ustedes tengan ahí, pedimos entonces, abuelos, así encender los cuatro rumbos, donde nace el sol, donde baja el sol, donde descansan todos ustedes, abuelos. Pedimos así, encendido también del viento, de los cuatro vientos, abuelos. Pedimos mucho para que 
fortalezca siempre nuestro espíritu, fortalezca siempre nuestra memoria, nuestro pensamiento, que nuestro pensamiento sea siempre para construir, no para dañar, pidiendo mucho así al rumbo del sur, al rumbo del agua, al rumbo de las semillas, pidiendo mucho para que esta conferencia, para que este tiempo sea de construcción, sea de siembra, sea de mucha esperanza, abuelos, estos espacios, que siempre, siempre aprendamos a escuchar, que siempre, siempre aprendamos a preguntar, a reflexionar, a cuestionar, desde un respeto, desde una armonía, desde un equilibrio, sabiendo que estamos construyendo entre todos. Así, creador y formador, madre tierra, así, abuelos, abuelas, pidiendo mucho por todos los pueblos, por cada uno de los pueblos del norte, del sur, del este, del oeste, para que todos nos levantemos en paz, en amor, pidiendo mucho a fuerza, abuelos, por todos los pueblos que en este momento sufren de una guerra, sufren de tanta violencia. Pedimos mucho porque esta luz pueda llegar a cada uno de los corazones de los gobernantes. Pedimos mucho, abuelos, para cambiar siempre estas estructuras de opresión, estas estructuras de, de dominio. Así, creador y formador, abuelos, abuelitas, pidiendo mucha fuerza entonces para cada uno de nosotros, para cada uno de los que estamos en este, en este espacio con ustedes, con HIP, agradeciendo entonces a cada uno de ustedes, de sus organizaciones, de sus equipos, llevando esta luz a cada uno de los equipos para que también estén con mucha luz, con mucha fuerza. Contate a Tata, contate a Nana, contate con Dios, contate con Dios. Muchas gracias, muchas gracias por encender su vela, muchas gracias por... Aquí se van a quedar estas candelas encendidas, acompañando este proceso de, de la conferencia con ustedes. Entonces... Aquí termina mi, mi intervención. Muchísimas gracias. Gracias, Flori, por esa oración tan linda y tan relevante para los momentos que estamos viviendo hoy. Un fuerte abrazo y un beso para ustedes. Bienvenidos and welcome to Hispanics and Philanthropy's first virtual summit and an, an annual membership meeting. My name is Mary Skelton Roberts. I am chair of the HIP board. The timing of this summit gives us all an opportunity to reset and dig in. We are at an important inflection point for the very heart and soul of this country. While it might seem scary to see burning buildings and people rioting, it is a call for change. Like Ana Mari said, the frustration the inequality, the violence against our people, seeing government-sanctioned murder of Black men and women, seeing our babies put in cages, it has been building for years. We are now sounding the alarm on these broken systems and the conditions which have been visible and are now visible for everyone to see. Think about it. Latinos, represent more than 27% of COVID-19 deaths in hotspots across the U.S. and 39% in New York City alone. Half of all Latino small businesses are at risk for closing forever. Farm workers and essential workers, they don't have the luxury of staying at home and they're falling sick at disproportional rates. Migrants in detention centers, they are sick and being sent home to their country with no medical support. Enough is enough, ya basta. This is why we're here today. We are here to remind you that as Latinos, we have power, tenemos voz, and we need to use it. HIP is amplifying all of the darkness that we're seeing in the world, and we are also showing what the path forward might look like. We are highlighting groups like Justice for Migrant Women, Poder Latinx, and so many more. It's time to commit to rejecting the racism and white supremacy. We must, tenemos, to come together in solidarity and move from being allies to being accomplices in fighting for equality across the Americas. As Latinos, we have an opportunity, 
not just to join this movement, but to help shape its outcome. How do we make sure that my 14-year-old daughter, Dalia, that your children, your grandchildren, have the future that they deserve? 2020 is not the year that any of us expected, but it's the year that HIP and we as Latino, we will show us the power of community, the power of resilience, the power of giving family and having our voices heard. This year, HIP's virtual summit is centered on the theme, the time is now, the power is ours. Nuestro momento, nuestro poder. It is our call to action to philanthropy. Thank you again for each of you joining us in this timely summit. I'm gonna shift gears and do board business now. During my time on the board, I've learned so much about what it takes for HIP to accomplish important milestones and to move the needle on behalf of Latino communities. What I've learned most of all is that none of this is achieved alone. HIP takes a collective approach and that applies to the board as well. And this board, I'm proud to say, is strong and more important than ever. We have two very important board members stepping down this year. We have Miguel Busto, my colleague, friend, partner in crime, I will miss you dearly. And we have Rafael Cortes da Pena. Rafael, you have been instrumental to the board, asking us hard questions and forcing us to be our best selves. We will miss you both. I would like a moment of applause. Gracias, Rafael and Miguel, for all you have done. Sadly, this year, we also lost Dr. Beatriz Solis after a long illness. Beatriz B was a great friend, a colleague, and a champion for women's rights and women's health in California and throughout our community. She was on the board with me on HIP for the past six years, and she's gonna be greatly missed by all of us. It's an enormous loss for philanthropy. It's a loss for HIP. It's a loss for our community, and it's a, a loss for her beloved family. Please join me in a moment of silence. B, we love you, and you will live on forever in our hearts. Now, as we look to the future, we have to think of growing the HIP board. This year, the candidates being presented for a first term, Marcos, Marco Davis, President and CEO of Congressional Hispanic Caucus Institute, Tony Mestres, President and CEO of the Seattle Foundation, and Maria del Socorro Pesqueira, President of Health Commu Healthy Communities Foundation. We also have two officers up for re-election for a second term. Betsy Campbell at the Rockefeller Brothers Fund and Julio Copo, Manon Quintana Abogadas, Abogados. Voting members, the ballots have been emailed and they should be at the top of your email box. You will have until June 12th to cast your vote by clicking yes or no. And please note that you're voting for the entire slate, not individual candidates. Thank you all. Thank you to all the members who have joined us today. There are so many benefits to being a HIP member. And the biggest one is that you are part of our collective corazón, the HIP familia. Again, the theme for this year's conference, the time is now, the power is ours. And it's so relevant in this moment in history. I would like to now introduce Irma Herrera, is a San Francisco-based, area-based writer and solo performer. Ila Solo Play, Why Would I Mispronounce My Own Name, has received critical acclaim from audience and reviewers. Irma. Muchas gracias. Thank you so much for inviting me to be part of HIP's virtual summit. Like you, my heart is filled with sorrow, rage, fear, and over the past few years, there have been several points when I have thought our country had reached rock bottom. 
the mu murders at Mother Emanuel Church, the caging of immigrant children, a white supremacist walking into a Walmart and gunning down 46 people, killing 23 because he wanted to stop the Hispanic invasion of Texas. And last week, the videotaped murder of George Floyd. It's just too much the final straw. There is no peace without justice. And it was my desire to live in a society and help create a society of peace and justice that led me to law school. Because I grew up with Jim Crow. He was as much a part of my life in South Texas as people experienced in Birmingham, Alabama. And thanks to affirmative action, I did become a lawyer. And in the early 80s, I moved to San Francisco to work for Malda. And there I had wonderful colleagues like Stan Criollos and Diana Campoamor, Joaquin Avila, Antonia. The list goes on and on, Vilma. So I have been connected to the people who are at the heart of shaping HIP from its inception. And I'm so happy to be here today to share in the next two days of this summit. How do you make a leap from becoming a lawyer to a performance artist? Well, it isn't a big leap because at heart, lawyers are storytellers. And I have a favorite quote. I wish it were mine, but it isn't. It was written by a woman, a white woman activist, a racial justice warrior, Patty Dye. And it is this, the closest distance between two people is a story. Stories connect us and allow us to feel something that we don't get when we have logic and statistics put before us. A friend invited me to take a solo storytelling class with her at the March Theater several years ago. And so I took it and I fell in love with, an art, with the art form. And within three years, I had produced, I had written a one woman show and I had the good fortune of getting it onto the stage. And I'm pleased to say it's been really well received. And my work as a performance artist revolves around the same themes as my law career. And that is how white supremacy and racism shape our lives and limit our opportunities. And before I share a brief excerpt of my one woman show with you, you need a tiny bit of backstory. And it is about my uncle, my Tio Otilio, married to my mother's older sister, Tio Otilio and Tia Maria, drove 28 miles from Robstown, Texas to Alice, two Sundays a month to pay us a visit. And Theo was always so nicely dressed with a guayabera press flag, y botas de cowboy, a tall, good looking man with salt and pepper hair, trim bigote, and skin the color of pecan shells. One day I'm with my parents. We were driving to a doctor's appointment in Corpus Christi. When we stop at Tia Maria and Tio Tilio's house, and just as Tia is greeting us at the door, we hear the loud rumble of the big company truck that Tio drives delivering gravel. While the grown ups sit at the kitchen table and visit for a few minutes, I notice Tio's shirt has a patch with letters on it. I'm six years old and just learning to read, and I sound out the letters T O M. Tom? In the car, I asked my dad, why your shirt says Tom? Porque that's what they call him at work. I asked, do people at work have different names? And my dad says, no, mija. The Americanos can't say Otilio. So they call him Tom. And I'm guessing that all of us can say Otilio. Please play the first clip. I was telling you about moving to San Francisco and this 
wonderful, amazing job with the Mexican American Legal Defense Fund, and I got to work on cases that really mattered to the Latino community. And one of those, we represented children from the state of Texas. That state had passed a law that denied undocumented kids a free public education. It went up through the courts and all the way to the United States Supreme Court that ruled in a five to four decision in Plyler versus Stowe that it was unconstitutional to deny children a free public education. The day we get the decision, we are so happy at our office and thrilled with the outcome. And so we open up a bottle or two of wine and after a glass or two, we are giddy. And I say to my coworkers, okay, now that we got these kids into school, how do we get teachers to not change their names? I tell the story about Tio Tilio being called Tom, unleashing a flurry of name stories. <laughs> In third grade, La Miss McGuire, she called me Marion all year. And I told her, Miss McGuire, I'm a boy. <laughs> My name is Mariano, pero no. <coughs> She called me Marion. <laughs> I didn't have it as bad as Jesus. She called him Jesus. <laughs> Híjole, we were so pinches, we throw ourselves on the floor, say, Jesus, make a miracle. <laughs> Help me walk, Jesus. <laughs> Jesus, he was the smartest kid in our class. Pero sabes? He never raised his hand, nunca. Well, uh, when I, I started school in Compton, uh, all the teachers called me Jack. So all through school, everybody knew me as Jack. But when I went to college at Yale, I decided to reclaim my name. So I would introduce myself and tell people my name was Joaquin, Joaquin. It's not hearts like walking, Joaquin. Well, anyway, I was active with the UFW Great Boycott back then. And one Saturday, this Episcopal priest and two, two monjitas, two nuns and I, we were gonna go talk to a grocery store manager to, to ask him not to, not to carry non-union grapes. And so we're driving there and he says, uh, son, remind me how to say your name. And so I tell him, I say, it's Joaquin Avila, sir. Joaquin Avila. Yes, I think I have that. Thank you, son. So we get to this meeting and he introduces himself. He says, this is Sister Mary Agnes, Sister Bernadette, and Yale student, Hava Nagila. <laughs> Joaquin never got to see my full play, but he did see an early uh, segment where that piece was videotaped and he got such a kick out of it. When COVID-19 hit, I was about to uh, schedule a new run of my show at the Marsh Theater in San Francisco. And of course, theaters and everything else went dark and we don't know how long this will be the case. So I'm sitting at home one day and I get this crazy idea. I have a tripod and an iPhone. I can create my own theater. So I started my Stairwell Teatro series. Please play the first episode. Bienvenidos. Welcome to episode one of my Stairwell Theater series, taped live at La Scala, the stairwell at my home in Northern California. I'm Irma Herrera, playwright and solo performer of Why Would I Mispronounce My Own Name. In this series, I will be telling stories about names. And often, the story involves my own name, Irma, which in English is pronounced Irma. 
but that's not how I say my name. So when I go to places like a cafe, a Starbucks or a Pete's, I don't give my real name. I use the name Maria. But several years ago, I was in Madrid, Spain, and I went into a Starbucks to charge my phone and to relax for a little while. I ordered a cup of coffee at the counter and the barista asked my name. I was about to say Maria when I realized I didn't need to do that. Here is a clip of me performing this scene at an earlier show in San Francisco. Have a look. I'm in Madrid, <laughs> Spain, not New Mexico. And I'm at a Starbucks. And it looks just like the Starbucks here. I'm there to use the Wi-Fi and to charge my phone. Un café con leche, por favor. Tu nombre? Wait a minute. I don't have to say Maria. I'm in the mothership. <laughs> Mi nombre es Irma. Irma, café con leche. Gracias, joven. ¿Puedo pedirte un favor? I asked the barista, can I videotape him saying my name? <laughs> when she came out with the Starbucks cups with her Starbucks name, I could really relate to that. My name is Selenia, and needless to say, people constantly mispronounce it and can't even begin to spell it. So my Starbucks name is Bob. What I love about my new venture, my stairwell teatro, is that it allows me to tell stories that don't fit into my play, but which contextualize the narrative of race in this country. And I've been getting great feedback from people who watch my series, along with many ideas about future episodes. And we're going to share one final episode from my Stairwell Teatro. Please. The Javier episode. Bienvenidos. Welcome to another episode of my Stairwell Teatro. Today we are approaching day 60, two months of sheltering in place in Northern California. Sometime last year, I was watching the local news and the anchor reported a story about California's attorney general bringing a lawsuit against the Trump administration. I'm sure she's looking at the teleprompter and she says, California attorney general Xavier Becerra eeks like nails on chalkboard because the attorney general's name is pronounced Javier. I wanted to throw a chancla at my TV set, but I didn't. Now, for those of you who don't know what a chancla is, it's a flip-flop, and Mexican-American kids live in fear of the flip-flop that your mom might throw your way when you misbehave. So I decided to find her email address and to write this anchor. And so I penned an email telling her that the attorney general's name is pronounced Javier, and I spelled it for her phonetically. Well, to my pleasant surprise, within an hour of my having written that email, I get a response from her saying, thank you very much for pointing out my mistake. I did not know that this was how the Attorney General's first name is pronounced. I will pronounce it correctly in the future. The name Javier has multiple correct pronunciations. Some people pronounce it Xavier, like Xavier University. And a friend of mine whose origins are in El Salvador is married 
to someone with a name spelled X-A-V-I-E-R, and they name their child that name as well, and they pronounce it Xavier. So when in doubt, ask. Several years ago, uh, when Arnold Schwarzenegger had the opportunity to fill the Chief Justice of the California Supreme Court seat, he appointed an appellate judge, a Filipina American with a hyphenated last name. When she was appointed to this post, the legal press made note of the fact that people needed to learn how to pronounce her last name and offered phonetic assistance. And I thought that was great. But you shouldn't have to be a Supreme Court justice to have people say your name correctly. So if someone brings to your attention that you've mispronounced their name, ask them to help you with it. And if you know that someone is mispronouncing an individual's name, be a good bystander and tell that person, oh, by the way, her last name is Cantil Sakaue. Thank you so much for watching and please keep sending me your comments and ideas for future episodes. Thanks so much. It has been such great fun to produce this series. And as you can see, I'm doing it in my stairwell. I have to remind my spouse and son to stay away from my set while I'm recording. And I'm learning um, to use basic software to edit videos. So, you know, it's a little bit on the rascuacho side, but that's part of the fun. Anyhow, I invite you to subscribe to my newsletter. You'll get in your inbox a blog and the latest episode. You can binge watch the entire series in less than an hour because I'm only up to episode eight and they are five minutes or less. And uh, follow me on social media because there we can continue the conversation about how we will work together to topple the systemic racial injustice that is crippling our country. I look forward to seeing you at various sessions during the two-day HIP Summit. Muchísimas gracias.